Okay, now it's time. So we are going to be presenting one story, essentially how we use several Cloud Native Foundation projects to uh, build a telemetry pipeline, mostly with a network automation a use case in mind. Uh, and the key elements are Kubernetes and some op operators, including the Stream C1. And yeah, the idea is we will be introducing ourselves, the context. Then we will describe uh, a bit the project and the platform supporting that project to then uh, cover some details about the solution as well as some associated problems and issues we had. Uh, we will be using a slightly different format for this. And before closing, we will be also sharing some highlights about the impact in our organization. But before that, Fernando. Hi, everyone. I hope you are all having a great conference so far. So I'm Fernando. I'm working at Fastly. I'm basically enabling Kubernetes uh, for Fastly control plane applications. Kubernetes is not a new space to me. I think I started on the early stages, th thanks to companies like uh, 20, Nagra, and Bitnami. I had a great experience there. And I also had the pleasure to contribute to the Kubernetes open source community with bug fixes, features, and, and even custom controllers like uh, 20 Secrets Manager. Um, so this is me. Then I hand over to Danny again. And yes, this is Daniel, uh, just an engineer at Fastly. I've been in the, like doing lots of data, de DevOps stuff, uh, mostly in the Barcelona area, so also from Spain. And uh, yes, I also love open source, and I try to contribute as much as I can. And also, let's introduce a bit uh, our company, Fastly. Maybe you already know about us. Uh, our mission in the end is to make internet users happy. And how do we try to do this? It's mostly by having a distributed architecture where our customers can, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Where our customers can uh, execute code as close as possible uh, to the end users and deliver contents, uh, bearing in mind performance and uh, reliability. So uh, yes, we have like a relatively large network uh, defined by software. We let our customers to run applications in our edge. And uh, yeah, the idea is to make our customers as autonomous as possible, to let them just to create uh, whatever they need in our platform and benefit from our infrastructure. Some uh, numbers, if you are more used to requests per second, 8 billion requests per day means an average of 10, uh, 10 uh, million requests per second. So uh, yeah, the size is relatively high. And uh, that was quite clear probably almost one year ago that we had an outage, a one hour outage, and we were on the news. So that's scary, but also interesting at the same time. And yes, this is more or less how our network looks like today. So we have many points of presence across the globe. Uh, we try to put them close to our end users. And uh, the main uh, concept here is that the scale of the network is quite high. And as a consequence, we need more stuff, so things that are not in that data plane in our fleet. We need the control plane as well to orchestrate and to manage all this large network. Actually, in the control plane is where most of the automation magic lives. And this story is about one of these uh, automation uh, uh, services, which is Autopilot. Autopilot is probably not a very original name. I think I have heard about like autopilot three times already in this conference, but this is our autopilot. And in order to introduce the problem that it solves, let's take a look uh, to uh, our, how our uh, POP networking looks like at high level. The idea is that, yeah, we have uh, devices, network devices, compute devices, and they are connected to uh, several uh, ASNs, other ESNs. So some of them act as transit providers for us. So essentially, when we send traffic, they can route the traffic uh, anywhere on internet. We have other relationships with other ASNs. So we may have direct links, peering uh, relationships with them. Uh, but here, the key message is that in order to deliver traffic from our platform, there are multiple links uh, available, so many routes for a given destination. And in the end, we need to make decisions about what, what is the best 
way to uh, forward traffic to our end users and also to the origin servers. And that is what Autopilot is trying to solve. It's uh, about bidding in mind performance, bidding in mind capacity, how hot our links are. Uh, we need uh, to route traffic accordingly. And uh, automation here is not a new thing. If you browse our engineering blog post, you will find previous iterations of this. If you are also working in a large uh, scale network in a big tech company, maybe you have your own solution for this. And who is behind this last iteration of uh, Autopilot? It's, uh, essentially, it's the NCO team that it's in net in network systems uh, at Fastly. And uh, initially, we had like six engineers uh, focused in that initiative. And these uh, engineers were, we had like mixed uh, skills. So there were software engineers, network engineers, uh, also SREs like me. And uh, here is one also of the uh, key messages. In the end, there are many implementation possibilities for something like this, but we need to be in mind the team supporting extending this solution, and that was uh, also a key item in our design. So Autopilot at very high level, uh, we are not reinventing the wheel. We follow the typical pattern of measuring things, then computing if we need to push a network change, and finally, uh, also uh, the routing manager, like a wrapper of our, uh, uh, of our routing infrastructure, which in the end also applies the changes uh, to our fleet. Let's actually focus in the yellow box, the, tele the telemetry pipeline. And what is that telemetry pipeline doing? It's essentially uh, consolidating many inputs, uh, telemetry data from many sources. We have systems. Uh, information, so metrics mostly from our Prometheus infrastructure that uh, describe the status of the links, uh, what is the capacity of the links we have. Then we have flow data, and that is uh, super key uh, for this uh, problem. In, uh, we are sampling like uh, the network data we are moving in our fleet in order to know uh, what, uh, what are the destination uh, of every packet we are sending. Uh, to across our net network, we are sampling, of course. And uh, then uh, we also consider performance data, even at application level. And even we are also proving um, the different links we have in order to uh, know what's the, the performance uh, and the status of uh, these links in our network. So how the pipeline actually looks like. This is the portion that cares about the, the, the net flow, the S flow uh, data. Uh, consumption. So essentially, we have network devices, switches in our case, which are emitting uh, S flow information with an S flow agent. We encapsulate that data using a DTLS tunnel. So everything is UDP, and that will be relevant later. Then, uh, in the actual pipeline, we process, we have a first stage that is kind of enriching and aggregating some data using PMAT, that is another uh, open source project, to finally push all the data uh, to a Kafka topic that is acting like a buffer. So, and finally, we have an API on top of this that is maintaining like an in-memory uh, view of uh, the network state. So uh, offers and gRPC API, other components are consuming, including the controller that is the one that implements the, the magic. In order to enrich that telemetry data, we also need to know the routing state. And we do this uh, via that route uh, manager service. And finally, as I mentioned, we are also collecting, uh, consolidating uh, metrics from our Prometheus infrastructure, essentially uh, some counters and other data directly coming from our switches. So in order to run uh, these uh, services, uh, that uh, architecture I described, we uh, need to process data at certain scale. Uh, just to give you an idea, it's more or less, uh, given the sampling we are doing, it's uh, about processing uh, hundreds of thousands of packets per second. The, uh, we need a runtime to manage uh, these components, uh, these services, to deploy new versions, and so on. And uh, of course, as everyone wants, probably, uh, we want to run this in uh, many different locations, uh, as close as possible to uh, our points of presence. So we need to put this in several places. And we also want to be uh, this solution they wanted to be also cloud agnostic, so we didn't want to couple this to another cloud provider. Uh, given our control plane is very diverse, 
Uh, we wanted to be able to run this also in some dedicated data centers we have for control plane uh, workloads. And uh, yes, uh, surprise, in order to run uh, control plane uh, workloads, uh, when we started this project, we didn't have like a proper standard. So for the data plane, yes, everything is super standardized. So every component we put in our fleet is following, is, is using some frameworks and well-known patterns. But for the control plane, it's a different story. Uh, we uh, had a mixture of different infrastructures, different cloud providers, and uh, yeah, even in the network control and opti optimization team, we were already using Kubernetes, but many Kubernetes clusters in uh, Google Cloud, uh, mostly dedicated for individual uh, workloads. And actually, regarding Kafka, uh, Fastly was already using Kafka for other use cases, but we didn't have like a proper uh, production-ready setup. Uh, so there was actually even opposition from the team uh, to incorporate Kafka in the project scope, given there was the perception that that was complicated, was complex, we were on a small team, so managing something like this could be a challenge. And now I'm handing over to Fernando, who will, will, who will describe a bit more the Kubernetes posture and what's the platform point of view and how the Kubernetes offering and the internal offering uh, evolve uh, to match uh, these requirements. So, <clears throat> thank you, Danny. Uh, Kubernetes at Fastly is circa 2020. Um, it pretty much looked like this. You want a cluster, you get a cluster. You want a cluster, you get a cluster. Everyone get a cluster. Um, th teams were pretty autonomous here. Like Teams will own like cloud projects or cloud accounts and create their infrastructure. Uh, the problem is that that led to a very fragmented, underutilized, and expensive infrastructure. Like Danny mentioned, we, we have several clusters over there hosting only one service maybe. And since it also came from mostly individual initiative, there was no standard way of creating the clusters, configuring them, or even deploying to them. Some folks will use Terraform, some other folks will use the Cloud Console directly, others Pulumi. Some people will use Helm to deploy, others Roy YAML, others Customize. And, and there was also a maintenance burden because most mostly the engineers deploying on Kubernetes, they didn't have the experience to administrate uh, Kubernetes clusters. So Fastly decided to create a um, Kubernetes team. Initially, we were four, two folks in New Zealand, one in Canada, and myself in Spain. And the goals were to build a Kubernetes shared platform for the control plane, standardizing infrastructure deployment and application deployment, and the scale eventually cross region, cross clouds, and um, eventually elevate also developers' capability to deploy faster and scale. And the latter brought the project name, which is also not very original, <coughs> Elevation. So let's talk about Elevation a bit. Elevation first version was indeed pretty simple. We started with uh, one cluster per stage and only one region, but we designed everything to scale cross region. So if we need more region, we, we will create another cluster. We standardized it on Helm via Flux CD using a GitOps pattern because GitOps was not new to Fastly, even when they were not using Kubernetes at the beginning. And we deployed to one single cloud provider, but the stack, the whole stack was designed to be cloud agnostic because we were envisioning that some people would request other cloud provider or even bare clusters. So to accomplish that, we did things like um, implement authentication with our identity provider, not tying to the cloud AAM, we were using Harbor, we were using Harbor as the container registry, not GCR, not ECR, or anything like that. We we're using Vault for secrets management because you know Kubernetes secrets, um, you know. <laughs> and also we're using Ingress Nginx and are using the cloud Ingress. And also Ser Manager is not the cloud Google Cloud Ser Manager, AWS Ser Manager, anything like that. We're using JetStack Ser Manager to issue thirds from Lesson Create and also from our uh, recently released um, root CA. Our observability stack is pretty common. Obser um, Prometheus, Grafana, Splunk, FluentD. So it's also open source, not tying into anything, uh, not tying into any cloud uh, provider. So as soon as we released the first version, we started having the first customers, and we tried to gather feedback. Um, the most important feedback we got is, hey, we, we need more regions. We, we need more cloud providers. We would like to have parameter clusters because we are hosting latency sensitive applications. So we, we want to be closer to this pop or closer to that pop or this fastly deployment or this cloud service, right? Um, so we got it. Um, the, the other thing was reducing the onboarding overhead because the onboarding at the beginning was a bit convoluted. So folks will register the namespace and will register a predefined service account. 
So then we will have to configure Bolt so the service account can read in a specific uh, path in Bolt. And that was a bit, you know, convoluted, like I said. Also, the pilot team, they wanted a proper um, Kafka, Kafka support in the company without needing to go and create more VMs, peering with the VPC, or something like that. So they wanted something in cluster, and they asked for, for help. Um, also, the, there, there were other teams that they were not they were completely new to Kubernetes, Helm, and all that stuff. And, and when they tried to, to get into, into our platform, they were like, oh, geez, this is overwhelming. Uh, can, we, can, can you folks build more abstractions to, to engineers like us, more used to networking than, than the, um, Kubernetes? So um, also, we provide a service mesh in the first version. And we were not providing like, a lot of visibility into a service mesh. So that was a, a reasonable ask. So we did. And with that come the second version of Elevation, which is more or less how Kubernetes uh, looks at Fastly today. It, it, became pretty quickly, pretty, oh, sorry. it became clear pretty quickly that with 40 members, we won't be able to scale properly and create cluster cross-region and cross-clouds and whatnot. So, so we got two new members that have been very helpful, uh, one in the US and one in the UK. So this is what we did. Clusters in Google Cloud, in AWS, Barrier Metal, is, uh, spanning across three different continents, uh, regions, and so on and so forth. Um, and we have today, I think, like 20 ish clusters. Um, and I'm probably we're creating three or four more in the coming weeks. So that was, that was what we did. Um, one of the key messages that I want to share is that we started relying a lot on operators, the existing operators and operators that we built in the team. And that was, a, that was a huge win for self-service, making teams more autonomous and automation uh, and stuff like that. This is one of the examples. So, so we built um, a custom controller to configure HashiCorp Bolt. So we, we have also a tool called Kiverno, maybe you're familiar with it, uh, which is a policy management tool. So now when, when people are registering a namespace in Elevation, uh, under the hood, Kiverno will create a secret engine KV2 secret engine that will get mounted automatically in a slash namespace. Also, when a service account gets created, no need for registering a service account or shit like that. Um, Kiverno will create a bold role and a bold policy using our bold controller. Uh, so that solved the whole, the whole onboarding issues, and, and we relied in, in, more, in more controllers. Also, we provided some abstractions. Um, we created a library chart and also a default chart that will encompass like, you know, all the best practices, like uh, making sure that you have uh, pod description budgets, that you have pod anti-affinities, and uh, you don't have to care about, should I put this annotation for this or that annotation for that, what ingress class, uh, what ser manager issuer, um, and stuff like that. So with this simple YAML file, people will, will, will be able to deploy an HTTP application with TLS and ingress routing. We made some observability improvements. So in Elevation, uh, I think this is pretty common pattern. Whenever you deploy your containers into Elevation, you, you, we provide it with a default dashboard, which is called the workload overview, right? So you will get CPU, uh, memory, and, and stuff like that. But we were missing like a lot of um, service mesh visibility, so we built in a bunch of Linkerd dashboards into our default dashboard. But of course, we enabled the Linkerd UI, and we enabled teams to execute on their namespace, Linkerd tab, Linkerd top, and all that stuff to troubleshoot because it's freaking important for teams like Autopilot, uh, which are indeed is a network service, right? Other than that, um, GitOps is cool, but people were like, okay, so this thing got merged. So now what? Is it deployed or not? So we created a bunch of Grafana tables and dashboard. This is just an example. So to make sure that they understand like the thing got deployed correctly. And of course, we, we talk about um, using an operator in the cluster. Um, um, we agreed that like, the string C seemed like a, a, strong, a strong operator, well-maintained, to provide uh, cell service around creating Kafka clusters. And teams could be very autonomous on that. So I'm going to talk about a little bit how it is the user experience in Elevation today, and what teams like Autopilot are actually experiencing. So, we have a, an initial exploratory phase where we have like RBAC rules relax, relaxed, uh, policies relaxed, and uh, this, these are basically development clusters. 
we also, we also have a playground project in our container registry in Harvard, so people don't need CI to push an image to it. They, 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 they just go ahead, develop their thing, iterate, push their images, and then we will allow Harvard uh, playground project in our development cluster. There's no enforcement either on using flags, GitOps, or anything like that. They can use the default chart that we provide, their own health chart, raw YAML, customize, whatever they need to iterate and get their application running and then being able to move on to the next phase. Obviously, we have a bulk cluster per cluster, so they go and put their secrets there if they need to. Um, and once they feel comfortable, they go on, uh, to, to the next phase, which is build and, and then deploy. So, they just push their Docker file and their Helm chart. If they have a Helm chart and not using the default chart, then a Jenkins job will kick off. And the, then Jenkins will contact um, Hashcore Bolt with the Harbor plugin that we built in house to issue ephemeral Harbor robot account tokens. So then Jenkins will sign the images, will package the Helm chart, if any, and, and sign it as well, and then push it to Harbor's Fastlist project, which is the only one allowed in production and staging clusters. After that, they can just go ahead and deploy using flags. So they just need to create a pull request against our HEM releases repository. And some teams even go very uh, innovative and, and created their own Jenkins pipeline to automatically generate a HEM release from a Docker image tag, updating only the key values that they need. Then flags will go and synchronize and deploy uh, the HEM release to the uh, Kubernetes cluster. So now I hand over to Danny to explain the good, the bad, and the ugly things about all, this, all of this. Correct. So yes, we are going to now present some details about uh, the solution in three different buckets. And that reminded us uh, this film, film, by the way, that I didn't know, but it was recorded here in several locations in Spain, including uh, Almeria, that is in the south of, uh, let's say, Valencia. So uh, yes, let's first see the, be the first bucket, good things. And one is like configuration management for uh, this uh, solution. So this, uh, this piece of uh, YAML, hope the guys in the back of the room can read something, but this is just uh, an example that comes uh, in the StreamC uh, documentation. It's just how to create an example Kafka uh, cluster. You define several properties, including uh, the sizing, uh, how which uh, some defaults and uh, even some properties of the Zookeeper uh, cluster that it's backing the, the uh, that, that it's backing Kafka, and even other uh, operators uh, that we can you can plug uh, to this uh, to this setup. But we didn't stop there, as Fernando mentioned. Uh, we are using Helm charts uh, to uh, push workloads to the elevation to the Kubernetes clusters. So we also created one for the telemetry Kafka. And that chart is actually exposing some values. Some of them are sizing matters, which are not abstracting the cluster too much. But some others, and I think the important uh, piece is the autopilot sites uh, value that it's in the bottom. Uh, it's the list of pops that a given deployment, a given autopilot deployment is expected to support. We have equivalent uh, properties in other autopilot services. And the idea in the case of Kafka is that if you define a specific pop you want to support in a cluster, uh, automatically uh, you are going to get the topics uh, you need uh, for the uh, telemetry data for that pop. You are going to get a write user with the right uh, grants, a read user, and also the operator is going to store uh, some credentials directly as Kubernetes uh, secrets. Then uh, some processes that are emitting the data, like SFACTD from PMACT, can uh, pick the secrets and directly start pushing the data to the, to the topics. And the same for the reader. Uh, in a predictable location, they can pick the credentials. And that's it. So everything is plugged. And uh, here, so the first uh, key point in this section is like we don't have a separate uh, tool on our configuration management system for the Kafka cluster. It's just another Helm release in, as we have for the other applications. And in fact, in the past, I have been promoting, for instance, Pulumi a lot, also externally. But not having uh, to require an a different tool to manage your Kafka cluster is even better than the best of the tools. So uh, more things about the Helm chart we have in the middle. That is also, as I mentioned, a good abstraction opportunity. 
Uh, and uh, the sizing knobs, uh, which are very coupled to the uh, Kafka setup, could be even uh, removed. Uh, now that we are supporting this solution in many pops, we can predict how much, uh, let's say, how big the Kafka cluster needs to be given the number of pops we are supporting. So we could even drop uh, these uh, values and in the end just have the, the list of pops we are going to support. Regarding portability, uh, these are just a few commands. Uh, this is the Helm uh, releases repo uh, Fernando was mentioning. So we have several Helm releases as uh, YAML files in a given folder, one folder uh, per uh, cluster. And in the end, in order to, uh, to deploy autopilot in a different cluster with the same configuration, it's as simple as copying the Helm releases. And in fact, that is already out outdated. It's uh, where Autopilot was already running a few weeks ago, and was uh, we had uh, many different clusters, some in AWS, some in GCP, and everything looks more or less the same from a configuration perspective. Regarding plugability, and mostly focused in operational uh, tooling, I think the, the also the Streamsy operator does a great uh, job exposing uh, some uh, operational flows uh, directly as Kubernetes primitives. So in this case, if you want to browse which Kafka topics do we have, you can, you can just use uh, kubectl and uh, list uh, these objects. Or uh, even other uh, maintenance operations, like I want to trigger a rolling upgrade in my cluster. You just, uh, the streams operator maps this to an annotation in the stateful set for the cluster. So in order to trigger it, you just put that annotation and the magic happens. Then plugability, also with the observability systems. Uh, the Streamsy community is maintaining like uh, some great uh, Grafana dashboards, but it's not just the fact that we have Grafana to display uh, all the Prometheus metrics. It's the fact that uh, all uh, telemetry services uh, can share a common dashboard where you can uh, easily correlate information from the emitter of, uh, the, of Kafka with the Kafka metrics themselves. And that is super powerful to, in the end, uh, identify and correlate problems you may have in your setup. And the same applies to the logs. Uh, we are using Splunk, we are forwarding everything to Splunk, and in a single query, we can check, okay, what are the logs, in this case, of the uh, telemetry component, so the one that is consuming the data, but also the logs from the Kafka cluster, and you can easily uh, correlate events. So, a summary of this section, Kafka uh, in our setup is not a special thing, it's just another workload in the cluster, and we use the same tooling and the same processes to manage uh, Kafka, uh, as well as the other workloads we have in the telemetry pipeline. Then, things that are not uh, so great in uh, this setup is the fact that, yeah, we have an operator, an operator is an extra component you need to install and maintain in your cluster uh, compared uh, to some software as a service uh, solutions. And uh, actually that brings an interesting topic that it's ownership of the operator. Right now, uh, the operators in the elevation clusters are maintained by our platform team, so Fernando's uh, team. And uh, teams like uh, network systems, they are just consuming the operators. However, however, we feel like this, something like this may not scale uh, well. So in the moment we have other teams consuming or cre creating their Kafka clusters, just coordinating the teams uh, to, uh, to perform a Kafka upgrade, normally in hand with an operator upgrade, can easily become a full-time job. So uh, yeah, we bet that at some point, if uh, this solution is kind of uh, uh, consumed by other teams, uh, we may need uh, to involve uh, other uh, teams uh, to support the solution. Uh, and Fernando. The ugly, like, like me. So you know what happens when you have a Kubernetes in multiple clouds, uh, metal, you have a service mesh, you have UDP, you have BGP, that it, it's bound to happen that you're gonna find these dudes <laughs> just eating popcorn, uh, laughing at your face. So the, the first very interesting challenge that we found is that you know Autopilot Telemetry API receives like a constant UDP flow nonstop. It's nonstop from the switches. So we noticed that pod that got restarted and rescheduled into the same node, somehow the UDP packets started to be black hole. Uh, my teammate and, and friend, Danny Kuczynski, uh, thankfully <laughs> discovered the, a bug in Kube proxy, which basically, you know, when, when you're going from one endpoint to zero endpoint, Kube proxy 
will flash the contract entry corresponding to the load balancer uh, external IP and the pod IP, right? But contract, uh, sorry, the flow will still hit the node if it's rescheduling the same node. So a new contract entry was created before the IP tables not got applied, so the contract entry had the load balancer external IP and not the pod IP. Uh, that was very interesting. We found that bug. They fixed it pretty quickly, so that's done. This, this one is also a good one, very interesting, because it was the, um, a whole team effort, um, and I appreciate that. Um, so the, the, we hit a hard limit in, in AWS security group rule limit, and there were, we, we reached out to, the TAM, to our TAM. There was nothing they could do, and, and, and basically the problem is that the AWS load balancer controller will create an excessive amount of security group rules um, per, per load balancer. So it's one inbound rule, for the node security group per client traffic per allowed source IP, which is something that Autopilot, for instance, uses a lot. Um, and then one, one rule for the health check on each uh, subnet in the VPC. So one of the recommendations were, oh, switch to ALV, and it's, yeah, this is not HTTP, so not, not very helpful. Or switch to ELV, it's, it's deprecated, right? So not an option either. And uh, we, could, we, we needed also to preserve the source IP because otherwise we couldn't perform authentication based on IP and stuff like that. So, so uh, we, we didn't want to implement something like proxy protocol or anything like that. So we came up with a creative software solution, which basically was let's disable the security rule creation at all, and let, let's just use Kiberno to create a Calico global network policy that will allow or block traffic. So we did that. But you know, like in Kubernetes, there is an orphan dependent rule, right? So a load balancer service cannot own a global network policy because the global network policy is cluster scope and the load balancer is namespace scope. So Kiberno couldn't delete the, couldn't garbage collect the, the global network policy if the service, uh, if the load balancer service got deleted. So we implemented our own custom controller, custom service controller based on annotation only to, to garbage collect the Calico global network policy. This being rolled out in, in production like three, four weeks ago and it's working fine and we, we're not expecting uh, more issues in that regard. So handing over to Dan again. Yes, let's quickly uh, review the impact of uh, this setup in our teams. The first box actually represents the first PR we had in the telemetry uh, uh, repo. Uh, so, and it's actually the, the bootstrap. So just, uh, Gopher app is an internal tool to bootstrap uh, Golang projects. So it's just creating the structure. And the second is, uh, represents actually the moment where we enable the telemetry pipeline in a non-production uh, cluster. And it only took like uh, four weeks uh, to get the full solution working in that uh, non-production pop. And considering that the team was quite small, we also maintaining other services and doing other projects, that was pretty nice. Also reviewing the history of the, of the repo with the Helm chart for uh, the Kafka setup, uh, there, are, there were some changes in the last months, but they are mostly connected uh, to uh, Kafka upgrades and operator upgrades and not to scale the solution. We essentially, we were able to just adding additional values to scale the solution to all the pops. And in fact, if you take a look uh, to the Helm uh, releases repo, where we have the actual workloads we are running in production, you can see that there, are, there has been already like 10 uh, engineers contributing to the Kafka configuration mm -hmm. that uh, silently means these engineers have been creating Kafka topics, Kafka users, even without knowing. So yes, we have like this impression that, okay, Autopilot actually manage itself. And given this, uh, right now we are working to consolidate uh, other uh, telemetry uh, processing in the same uh, architecture. And uh, also the net, NetOps team, so network operations, uh, they uh, use this type of uh, network data to operate the network every day. But there are even other uh, use cases like capacity planning and implementing other solutions on top of uh, this information. And yes, and not only the Kafka, like the telemetry pipelines consolidation, we are also now migrating other workloads we had in these dedicated GKE clusters uh, to elevation, uh, so we can just focus in uh, other challenges we have. So let's now start closing uh, the session. Main uh, points, we need uh, like an scalable platform to run uh, network automation at Fastly, and Kubernetes is a great fit for this. 
And in addition, our very specific setup with some operators like the Stream C1 and also some other configurations is uh, helping us uh, in projects like, uh, like Autopilot and its uh, telemetry uh, pipeline. So thanks for being here. I think we have uh, maybe, well, not so much time for questions, but maybe we can accept one. Uh, I don't know if there is a microphone for this, or if you want to ask, and I will try to repeat. So how do you distribute, I understand you use the mutual collab for the, the cross communication, right, from the client side? Mutu, uh, we use mutual TLS for? Mutual collab for the, based on the cost of the distribution, right? Uh, not exactly, well, yes, it's a DTLS, and uh, yes, uh, the... Correct. Perfect. So the question is uh, how the, uh, the Kafka consumers and the producers, uh, how they do authenticate against the, the Kafka cluster. So, okay. So how we distribute the, uh, the certificates uh, across the, diff the differ different uh, workloads in the cluster. So here, uh, Streams is our friend. It's uh, when you declare a Kafka user that it's a specific object. Uh, Streams it's, uh, it's a cust custom resource. Uh, Streams gives uh, to the cluster. Uh, Streams actually there are different like user authentication types. Uh, yes, we are using uh, TLS based authentication, and that means that the Streams uh, creates uh, the credentials and stores the credentials uh, as uh, Kubernetes secrets. So then, uh, given the workloads uh, using Kafka live in the same cluster, we can directly uh, pull uh, these credentials uh, from uh, the other workloads. Correct, yes, we are using that uh, shared Kubernetes offering from platform, so we have a dedicated namespace for uh, autopilot services. So yes, uh, all these services live in a single namespace. Thank you. So thanks 